everyone. Um, so uh, I guess uh, Mark mostly went over uh, the, the introductory material on this with uh, you know, somewhat better slides, but um, uh, so as you know, we, we use the random oracle model a lot to uh, model protocols where um, we still don't know how to prove things in the standard model under standard assumptions. Um, and in the uh, quantum world, we want to be able to port this over um, so for, for which purpose we have the quantum random oracle model, but uh, the proofs in that model are much more difficult and, and often give looser bounds. Um, and we would like to, of course, be able to distinguish between, in some cases, the proofs give looser bounds, in some cases the attacks are actually better. So, uh, I mean, the, uh, the most well-known example is Grover's algorithm. Um, and so, uh, in, in that uh, direction, um, we want to, to sort of develop techniques that worked in the classic ROM that, that still work in the QROM. So uh, you heard in the last talk um, how to do this for recording the adversary's queries and responding adaptively, but there's still a, a large number of caveats on that. Um, and so it requires quite a lot of expertise to wield. So a simpler technique, but a weaker one, uh, is this one way to hiding technique that sort of still works in the QROM. So um, here we're uh, trying to make that easier to use, uh, apply to more cases, and have at least in some cases a, a lower security loss. So the, uh, the original work comes from Unruh, uh, who's one of the authors on this paper in 2015, uh, but his uh, one way to hiding only works in very restrictive settings and has a quadratic security loss in the number of queries Q that the adversary makes to the oracle. Um, and in here, um, uh, we sort of generalized it, removed a bunch of the restrictions, and tightened it so that it um, uh, can be as low as linear loss and linear in the depth of the queries that the adversary makes to the oracle, which, uh, practically speaking, could be much less than the total number. Um, so uh, an outline of the talk is a brief, brief uh, discussion of the differences between the, the classical versus the quantum ROM and these new one-way-to-hiding results, and then some examples of how you can use them to prove um, things, sort of time-permitting, in a relatively sane way. Um, so uh, you know how the random oracle works, so uh, most attacks uh, either are attacking a hash function or they're just treating it as a black box that returns random numbers, so you might call them generic. Um, and so you suppose that the attack would still work if the hash function really were a black box or a magic eight ball or something. Um, and so this formalizes a lot of intuition that you might have when designing a protocol, such as, you know, the attacker can't uh, know anything about the hash of a message without actually knowing what that message is. Um, and, and it allows you to furthermore extract the message because it has to be presented as an oracle query before the adversary knows anything about it. Um, and so you have all these proof techniques, right, where the simulator can, can control the random oracle, can see all the queries, can choose answers adaptively, can rewind the adversary, and so on. Um, and furthermore, you get uh, some very simple information theoretic limits about what adversaries can do on, on certain problems. So for example, if you're given h of x, um, then the adversary can't find x with probability more than q plus 1 over the domain size, um, because, well, he get, gets q shots to, to query it um, on random oracle queries, and then, you know, maybe one guess with his output. Um, and the, so there's a, there's a sort of trivial proof of that almost in the, in the classical random oracle model. Um, but in the quantum random oracle model, things get a little bit more complicated. So um, uh, the adversary can now query the hash function in quantum superposition. So uh, as Mark said, right, you could imagine like he puts in a sum of amplitude times x and gets out the sum of amplitude times hash of x, but that doesn't actually work because it's got to be reversible, so it's actually this uh, you know, x, y, and then and, and hash of x gets x ordered into y, but um, uh, same basic idea. Um, and so it's been uh, shown that, that quantum adversaries can do more in this model with fewer queries um, on some problems, and on some they can't. And so it, and it, it's kind of hard to tell intuitively which ones those are going to be. Um, and it's also very difficult to record queries to, to oracles. So if the oracle is a uniformly random quantum oracle, then the previous talk says, you can sort of record the queries approximately, and there's a little bit of loss in recovering them. Um, the simulator can, in some cases, respond adaptively, but again, there's a lot of caveats on that. Um, so uh, we're going to show a technique that that uh, can recover some semblance of, of uh, 
tightness in proofs without um, necessarily getting into the analysis required to, to, to figure out uh, uh, quantum recording of queries or to analyze too much into the quantum states. Um, but before we do that, one note on depth restriction. So um, uh, a realistic adversary, if it's querying an oracle many times, is like practically going to have to do this in parallel, right? So you want to make two to the 64 queries to an oracle for your attack. Um, if you're Bitcoin, then you're doing this four times a second, um, every second. Um, and that works because Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network has a huge number of computers that are operating in parallel, or rather ASICs operating in parallel. But if you were to do this sequentially, even if you could do it every clock cycle at five gigahertz, it would take more than 100 years. So practically you can say, uh, essentially no adversary on computers that we know about is going to be able to do two to the 64 sequential work, but they might very well easily be able to do two to the 64 parallel work. Um, so in addition to the number of queries, we're going to use um, a depth of queries, a sort of a circuit depth where uh, the, the things that add to the depth are oracle queries, um, which isn't necessarily less than or equal to Q. Um, and all this really does is in the analysis, it replaces you know, query with round of queries. And the reason we're doing this is that while in the classical random oracle model, it doesn't necessarily help you, like you still end up with a Q out front instead of a D out front in most cases. Um, in the QROM, it, it will help. So for example, Grover's algorithm is going to depend on the depth of the quantum queries and not just the number of them. Um, so uh, onward to one way to hiding. Um, so the, the classic version of this uh, idea is very simple. So um, if you're doing a proof by a, a series of games, then you're you know, sort of cheating the adversary a little bit more in each game step. Um, and one way that you might do that is by replacing you know, the previous random oracle with a slightly different, possibly less random oracle. Um, so uh, if you have two oracles, actually they don't have to be random, they can just be any, any oracles classically, um, that uh, agree um, everywhere except on some like, possibly small set S, um, then a, an adversary can't tell them apart without querying an element of that set. Uh, classically. It's uh, pretty obvious, right? Because the, they, they behave the same everywhere else. Um, and so in particular, if you have a simulator that's observing the, um, the oracle queries, then they can extract some x in that set if they can recognize it. Um, and the, the adversary's probability of telling the two oracles apart um, is necessarily less than or equal to the probability that the simulator extracts an s. Um, and so this is how you'll do, you know, the simulator can't tell apart the encryption of two messages unless he can tell the, the, the sim, sorry, the adversary can't tell apart the, the encryption of two messages unless he can tell the simulator, you know, the, the RSA problem answer or whatever, or the discrete log of something, CDH problem. Um, it, this is how you're going to construct your, your proofs in general. Um, of course, it's also possible that the, that the simulator is not able to recognize elements of S, like if it's a CDH problem, for example. Um, and in that case, uh, at worst, it can randomly choose one of those queries um, and uh, guess that that was the element of S. And then if the adversary is telling things apart with some probability, that's less than the number of queries times um, the, the probability that the simulator is extracting things. Um, so again, uh, while this talk is sort of nominally in the, in the random oracle model, this is going to work with things that are not necessarily random oracles. Um, they can be uh, oracles drawn from any, any sort of arbitrary distribution. They can be fixed oracles. Um, you know, the adversary still can't tell them apart without querying the place where they differ. Um, so the quantum case. Um, is uh, a little bit similar. So this appeared in Unruh's work in 2015, but with a lot of restrictions. So um, again, if, if, uh, if two oracles are the same except on some set S, the adversary can't tell them apart without querying that set. But it might query a superposition of many inputs, some of which are in the set and some of which are not. And they might have you know, certain amplitudes, you know, possibly small amplitudes on the set. Um, and that would give some chance of telling them apart and so on. So. Um, the, the one way to hiding theorem says uh, that, again, uh, this, this is assuming uh, to start with that the simulator cannot recognize the, the elements of this set. Um, so it will randomly choose some query, or since we're doing the, this depth restricted model, randomly choose a round of queries. 
um, measure all the queries in that round, um, and then output them. Um, and uh, it's possible that one of these is, in fact, in this, in this set, um, and call that, call that event guess. So um, whereas before, the probability was, uh, the distinguishing probability was at most Q times the guessing probability, here it's at most 2D times the square root of the guessing probability. And this will end up actually sort of being more like two times rad QD guessing probability because uh, this here we're outputting like multiple possible guesses. Um, and in the previous one, we were only outputting one. Um, an another fact that, uh, that comes from the same theorem is that the difference of square roots of probabilities of, of two events occurring, um, not just the distinguishing probability, this is also bounded by the same value. And that's going to be true for the other uh, theorems in this work as well because of the, the structure of the proof. Um, and the, the main point of this is that uh, usually in these oracle proofs, at some point you cheat the adversary so hard that he can't win. Um, so if, for example, um, the adversary can't win here and this probability is zero, then you can clear the square roots and you won't have this obnoxious square root. Whereas up, up here, if you, if you clear this, then you still have a, a square root um, in, the, in the bound. Um, so this raises the question of like, well, what happens if the simulator can recognize the set being queried? Um, and so you could imagine, well, you just measure whether, it's, uh, whether the input is in that set or not. And that's, that's what we do, but uh, you, can't, uh, you can't do it exactly like that, right? So suppose you have some quantum algorithm that recognizes an element of the set. The idea is that you, take, you get this quantum input x, and then you run the recognizer on it, and you measure only the output of the, the recognition um, function and not uh, the element x. Um, and then that tells you whether it's in the set or not. Um, and probably once you, you've recognized that it is in the set, then you're going to measure the x and output it. But if it's not in the set, if it's not the thing that the, that the simulator is looking for, um, then uh, you just return... Um, uh, you just return the output of the oracle and, and continue on. Um, and so this, this is what we call a punctured oracle. It's the, the hash punctured by this set that you're recognizing. And the, the reason it's called punctured is that if, uh, as long as you're, the adversary may, makes queries that are you know, measured not to be in the set, then his behavior doesn't depend on the value of the oracle there. So it sort of effectively removes those inputs from the domain of, of the random oracle. Um, and it also follows, interestingly, that uh, here we had, you know, uh, a guess given B talking to H in this bound. And it's, uh, since it's symmetric, it's obviously also true with B talking to G, but those bounds are not actually the same. Um, it could be that, you know, in one case the, the adversary finds a thing and then he keeps querying it over and over and over again. So if you guess a random query to, to look at, then, he's, then you're always going to get yes uh, on, on the one side, and on the other side he doesn't query it over and over again. But here um, the, the finding probability is actually the same on both sides. Um, so uh, the, the main lemma that we have on this, so that, that, was, that slide was just the, the description, right? So the main lemma is that... Um, if you, if you have these two sets, then um, the bound now has uh, d, or rather d plus 1, inside the square root. So before it was 2d square root of p guess. Now it's 2 square root of d plus 1 p find. And you can actually, this is not in the, the paper, but it's not difficult to tighten this d plus 1 to a d in here. Um, uh, but it, not, not in here. This one is still d plus 1, actually. Um, also, uh, the, the difference between AH and AH uh, punctured um, is, is bounded by this smaller term, um, as are you know, AH punctured and not find, AG punctured, AG punctured and not find, some, some fairly large number of things that really only differ in the case where uh, you found uh, an element of S. Um, and uh, so what this is saying, so up-leveling a minute from the equations, what this is saying is that measuring whether the adversary's queries are in this set um, will disturb the adversary's state. Um, that's unavoidable because that's, uh, that's the observer effect in quantum mechanics. But it only, it only will disturb the adversary's state by an amount that's proportional to the chance that he actually was querying an element of this set, um, and therefore proportional to, or 
the square root of that actually, the, but proportional to the square root of the chance that he was, he was querying an element of the set, and therefore proportional to the square root of the chance that you got your, the answer that you were looking for. Um, if the adversary is not very good at finding elements of this set and querying them, um, then uh, measuring, measuring the queries, or measuring whether they're in the set doesn't change it very much. Um, so uh, I don't want to go into the, the proofs of these uh, theorems. They're not terribly difficult, but uh, the basic idea is that, that they uh, are based on the, the sort of geometry of quantum states, that uh, quantum states are like unit vectors in this uh, high-dimensional complex vector space, but basically you can think of them as just being like vectors, right? And so the idea is that um, you can bound the, uh, the probabilities of, you know, differences in probabilities of final measurements um, having, uh, uh, having some, like, distinguishing probability or whatever based on the, the distance between those quantum states in a, in a Euclidean uh, measurement. So, like, it's, uh, it's well known if you do quantum computation that that this thing is bounded by something called the trace distance. In fact, that's basically the definition of the trace distance. Um, and both that and this difference of square roots are bounded by another quantity called the Bohr's distance, which is more complicated, but is roughly the expected Euclidean distance between the two states, or at least is bounded by that. Um, so that means that if you can prove something in geometry about how far apart these states are, or how, how, how far apart they can be for a given value of probability of find or probability of guess, um, then you will get these bounds on the, on the distinguishing probabilities. Um, so a, a final question that is actually pretty interesting to me, um, but uh, is uh, an important detail in these proofs on um, using semi-classical oracles is, what, what is the finding probability, right? So if you have a classical oracle, takes classical input, gives classical output, and you have, um, uh, a, a criterion that holds with probability epsilon everywhere, then, uh, and, the, and the adversary has no other information about where to find it, um, then the finding probability is necessarily less than Q epsilon, less than the number of queries he makes times the probability that any one of them succeeds. Um, but if the, the oracle gives quantum output, then uh, it could be up to Q squared epsilon, um, or I guess DQ epsilon, as we'll see later. Um, but, uh, and that, that's because of Grover's algorithm, right? Grover's algorithm lets you get a, a, a quadratic or almost quadratic speed up on, um, on searching for some, you know, rare property in an unstructured function. Um, but uh, in this case, you have a, a situation where the adversary makes a, uh, a quantum query and he gets a classical output, right? Is this in the set or not? Um, and so it's not clear intuitively whether this is more like the classical case or more like the quantum case. It turns out to be more like the, the classical case. So it turns out that this can speed up over the, the classical case by a factor of asymptotically exactly four. So there's some algorithm that will search, at least in some cases of, you know, unstructured function for um, uh, a value satisfying a predicate with a semi-classical oracle for it that's four times faster than the classical case, but not more than that. Um, so a result of this is that actually the, the fully quantum case of one way to hiding can be factored into uh, this search theorem plus the, the semi-classical case with uh, a loss of about two in the bound. But um, it, it's interesting to note that asymptotically at least it follows from um, the, the other two theorems in the paper. Um, so as a summary of these various one way to hiding me uh, methods, like imagine you're trying to distinguish uh, the adversary is trying to distinguish two oracles. He does it with probability delta, and the, the simulator is trying to extract a value of the set where they differ and, and does it with probability epsilon. Then we have these, these various bounds. So in the classic case, you know, if you can recognize it, then you get deltas less than epsilon. And if you can't, you get deltas less than Q epsilon. Um, in the, the quantum case, we've improved um, Unruh's bound from 2Q rad epsilon to something like to red DQ epsilon, but uh, I guess we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the, the difference is that, um, the, the bigger difference is that instead of having to be uniformly random oracles that differ in one uniformly random place, now they can be arbitrary oracles, possibly jointly distributed in some complicated way that differ in some arbitrary set of places. Um, so we've removed a lot of restrictions on that. 
Additionally, if the simulator can recognize the set that you're looking for, then um, it improves to d plus one inside the square root. Um, and then uh, as an interesting corollary, this was proved uh, after, after this work, but um, it's based on Jandri's talk. Um, you can use this or oracle recording technique to, if, if the simulator can simulate both of the oracles, like for example, if they differ only at the pre-image of some function and the, the, the simulator knows the function but they don't know, and they know the difference but they don't know the pre-image, um, then, uh, then you can get a bound that doesn't depend on the number of queries the adversary makes. Um, so that's kind of nice, but they have to, there's a, still a restriction on that. They have to differ in only one place. Um, so uh, finally, time check. Okay, um, let's get to uh, a couple of applications. I, I guess I probably won't get to all of them with four minutes um, of these techniques. So um, uh, the, the simple one is let's reprove bounds on Grover's uh, algorithm. So um, suppose that you have a function that you're searching for. It's got some property with probability epsilon at every point. Um, and let's compare this to a, to a function that doesn't have that property anywhere. So H is zero everywhere. Um, so these differ at the set S, which is exactly where, uh, you know, G of X is one. Um, and the adversary wants to output an element of that set. Or just to, to simplify the analysis, you might say that you want that if you take the adversary and then you run G afterwards, which you could call A, A sub one of G, um, then you get one. Um, and so the one way to hiding theorem tells us that the square root of the probability that that happens minus the probability that it happens for H is bounded by the guessing probability. Um, but in fact, it can't happen for H because H is zero everywhere. Um, it doesn't have that property anywhere. Uh, and also H has no information about this set because it's zero everywhere. Um, so the guessing probability is at most like the number of queries, although we added a query here and a, and a depth, the number of queries uh, over the depth because um, that's the average number of queries the adversary is making every round. Um, and so when you uh, plug that into this, this equation above and, and remove the square roots, then you get uh, the, the probability that you find an element with this property in the sparse random function is at most four d plus one q plus one epsilon. Um, so in other words, and I think this was well known before, but it's, uh, it's bounded by the depth of the, the adversary's computation times the number of queries he can make, not just by um, the, the number of queries squared, for example. So it doesn't parallelize very well. Um, another uh, simple application, uh, maybe I'll skim over this, is that if you have a function fk of x, which is h of k comma x, where h is a random oracle, then this is a pseudo-random function. So this is fairly obvious in the, in the classical world. Um, and in the quantum world, uh, indeed, you can get the PRF advantage is sort of less than, than this bound. And this bound is also very similar to the cost of a Grover attack um, on, on the, the seed of this pseudo-random function, or the key of this pseudo-random function. So it's about what you would expect. Um, and this comes just sort of straight from the, the one way to hiding lemma. So then I, I want to mention also briefly um, the, the Fujisaki Okamoto proof, which is slightly more involved. But um, the basic idea is, so, so suppose that you have a, an, an in-CPA secure public key encryption algorithm that's randomized, so it takes an input of coins, and you want to de-randomize it because you need to use it in Fujisaki Okamoto or whatever. Um, and so you'll set the coins equal to the hash of the message. Um, and since it's in-CPA secure, it's hard if you have two messages and a challenge that's the encryption of one of them with some unknown coins to figure out which, which one of these messages it is. Um, and so the, the proof technique um, is that you, can, you have your hash H, and you can also define a hash G that is you know, a variant of H that actually returns those coins, but you don't know what they are, uh, when, the, when the adversary queries the right message. Um, so you can't simulate this oracle. Um, but you do know where it differs from the oracle H. It, it differs at, like, at most, M0 and M1. Actually, only one of those, but you don't know which one. Um, and so if you plug this into the, the semi-classical one-way-to-hiding lemma, you get that the, the one-way advantage, or the square root of it, minus um, the chance that, you, uh, that it returns M and doesn't find in a, in a punctured version, which you can arrange to be zero, um, is bounded by this finding probability, um, which expands out to the one-way advantage is less than d plus two times the finding probability. And this is the probability that, that the sort of find thing either measures M0 or it measures M1. 
Um, and so this is a distinguisher on the a classical, I mean, there's a quantum computer, but it returns a classical result, a, a distinguisher on, on this uh, NCPA secure encryption system. Um, because it returns either M0 or M1, but the adversary doesn't actually have any information about the one that wasn't the encryption uh, that, that you got. Um, and so that means that on the, by the search theorem, there's a small chance that he finds it. And on the, uh, there's the chance that he finds the other one is bounded by that plus the, the end advantage, because it's, it's a distinguisher against, the, uh, against the, the randomized encryption scheme. And so in sum, uh, he has this limited advantage that's like D plus two times the end advantage, so that's not good. That's not, hopefully not tight, but we don't know. Um, plus this term, which is actually just a Grover attack on the, the message, which is what you would expect, um, times two or something. Um, so anyway, so this is, a, uh, this is a, a useful technique. It's been used already in a few papers, um, doing mostly Fujisaki Okamoto kind of stuff. Um, and I hope that we can sort of simplify it further and like synthesize this with the other uh, techniques that we have, like recording Oracle queries, um, so that they can be sort of more accessible and easier to use. Um, so that's all. We don't have time for questions, but uh, Mike will be around, I assume.